Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event. My name is Patrick Sayers. I'm a senior research fellow and the policy lead at the Humanitarian Policy Group at ODI in London. A very welcome to a very warm welcome to you all. Um, before we get started, uh, I wanted to make sure that you're aware that we have simultaneous translation today in both Ukrainian and Russian. Uh, available for this event. Um, all you have to do is click on the globe at the bottom of your screen to select the language you would like to listen in. I also wanted to say that closed captions are also available. Uh, you can access these by clicking on the button on the button at the bottom of your screen. And I will give a few minutes uh, for the room to fill in and for all our panelists to, to join. One of our panelists is a little bit late. I also wanted to say that today's event uh, is part of a series on Ukraine and the humanitarian response to the Ukraine conflict, which we are at ODI are organizing with the support of British Red Cross. And you will find in the chat box a link to the scoping paper for this series, as well as a link to an outcome document from a private roundtable on managing dilemmas in the humanitarian response to this crisis that was held on the 26th of May. So as I think you all know, 6 million Ukrainians have fled their country since the Russian invasion of February 2022. A majority have been hosted in neighboring countries where governments and civil society groups have been very quick to mobilize to receive and support refugees. The European Union has activated a temporary protection mechanism by which Ukrainians in any EU country receive temporary residence as well as access to jobs and services for one year. Billions have been pledged by the EU and international financial institutions in terms of macroeconomic and budgetary support to refugee hosting countries, particularly in Europe. But the international humanitarian system has also been activated um, and has been supported by generous funding from Western governments, but also massive private donations. The High Commissioner for Refugees has launched a refugee response plan worth 1.85 billion, and they and their partners have set up programs in countries neighboring Ukraine. What we're going to discuss today is whether humanitarian aid is an appropriate instrument in high income countries, in the case of Moldova, upper middle income countries, and specifically how the humanitarian system can strengthen national ownership and leadership of the refugee response in accordance with its commitments to localization and also the global refugee compact. And we're going to ask the question, what should the response architecture look like uh, in the medium to long term. And I am delighted that we have a panel of experts today to explore these and other questions. First of all, Wojtek Wilk, who is the CEO of the Polish Center for International Aid, um, which is a Polish humanitarian NGO that has projects in the Middle East and Africa, but also is responding to the influx of Ukrainian refugees in Poland. We are also extremely pleased to welcome Madalina Troza, who is Councillor of State in the Office of the Prime Minister of Romania, and who is the coordinator of the Romanian government's support to refugees from Ukraine. And finally, Angela Li Rosi, the Deputy Director for Europe at the UN's Office um, of the High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR. A warm welcome to all three of you. After we've heard from our panelists, we would love to hear questions and comments from our audience. 
you can share your thoughts and reflections in the chat box. But if you have a specific question for our panelists, please use the Q&A box to send these. And I will try and put them to, to the panel a little later on. And of course, we encourage you to tweet during this event using the HPG handle at HPG underscore ODI. And just a reminder that this event is being recorded. The video will be available on the event webpage in a couple of days time, and you'll be able to listen to it in podcast form as well on that page. So I'd like to turn over to you first, Wojtek, um, to give us a sense of how the response is um, evolving on the ground in Poland. And I see that you are actually at the moment in a, in a reception center. Over 4 million Ukrainians have crossed the border, if I'm not mistaken, and some mm -hmm. 1.2 million are currently registered as, as refugees in Poland. And, and we know that the Polish civil society response, particularly in the first few months, has been extraordinary. How has the government and how have international agencies supported these efforts? And how do you see the role of Polish NGOs um, evolving in, in the medium to long term. Over to you. Well, um, thank you very much, Patrick. And, and it's an honor to be uh, at the panel because I've, I've been a long term humanitarian. I've been very much following the work of ODI. Uh, well, good afternoon from Warsaw, from one of the transit centers, which has been set up in Poland to receive the um, refugees, uh, people fleeing the war in Ukraine. As you can see behind me, the those centers are becoming uh, increasingly empty, but not completely empty. I mean, the the, the slowdown, the the influx has have slowed down to a to a trickle, which is pretty much comparable to the regular flow of that we have seen prior to the war. But indeed, there are still people coming in, especially from Eastern Ukraine, and interestingly, from from areas that have been conquered by Russia, um, with the intention of seeking seeking safety and shelter in Poland. Uh, uh, Poland has indeed received on the incoming side about 4.4 million refugees who have crossed, or Ukrainians who have crossed into Poland. But over the course of the last uh, four months, so uh, uh, since 24th of, of February, about 2.5 million uh, of persons have crossed back into Ukraine. And very much this is just a regular um, uh, flow of people backwards and forwards. So we have a balance of about 1.95, maybe 2 million uh, Ukrainian citizens on this side, uh, again, not the Polish border, but the Schengen zone border. And then there is a very good question, what percentage of those people stays in a country like Poland? I assume also this applies to other uh, border countries to Ukraine, such as Romania. And our um, best estimate is that Poland holds uh, that about 75% of people who crossed through the Polish border that have stayed in Poland, the remaining 25% that have moved onwards towards Germany, and other countries that have indeed that are indeed hosting hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, so our best estimate is in Poland right now we have 1.5 million Ukrainian refugees. That is to some extent corroborated by the fact that the Polish government has registered 1.2 million for social security services. But indeed, there are still some people who may be still unsure because right now we are in the vacation time. Yeah, there are summer holidays. Um, there have been 200,000 Ukrainian children in the Polish schools. Out of an estimated six or seven hundred thousand, so many hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian children have stayed, have been learning online. We don't know what is going to happen in September, and this is that the, the, the switch to new school year is one of the factors that we are seeing that we are really stepping out from this uh, immediate rapid response to the crisis into some sort of the, of the medium term approach. Because uh, if people put their their kids in the Polish schools, those children are very likely to be there probably throughout the next school year, which is until the June of, the, of 2023. We are, uh, we, the, the, the initial influx of refugees have been cushioned by uh, a very robust rollout of the host family program in Poland, which has been to some extent supported by the Polish government. Very much it was bottoms up and the, the bottom up approach from various communities that have really mobilized and and, uh, and 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 provided shelter for the refugees. The parish priest in uh, in the small town where I'm coming from uh, have uh, have managed to secure housing for 700 Ukrainian families. So that's that it's just in one 
town of 20,000 people. So this, this, this gives you the, the, the size of the, the scope of the response. But right now, quite considerable number, because as many as 42% of adult refugees, they have gained employment in Poland, benefiting from, from a limited, um, a very low level of unemployment. And um, and this is this this is, it's it's really positive that many people are managing to, to 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 stand on their feet in Poland. For us as the Polish NGOs, the priority right now is to focus on the vulnerable groups, so elderly who constitute about five percent of the of the refugee caseload. But the uh, average uh, pension in Ukraine is about hundred dollars a month, which is insufficient to in in, in a European countries such as Poland, and especially insufficient to 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 rent any shelter on the persons with disabilities because they won't be able to work and also with mothers with small children because they won't be able to, to work either and here is a gap because while the polish government has rolled out uh, a social assistance uh, that is at the same um, at the same using the same principles as the social assistance used for the polish uh, citizens and among others that all ukrainian children are eligible for a uh, 500 zloty, which is about 110, 120 dollars per month child benefit, and there is no social assistance for other vulnerable groups, such as persons with disabilities or elderly, on this on the Polish side of the border. So here is a big task for the Polish NGOs, for the UN, UNHCR, for other international players to 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 look after those most vulnerable groups, and hopefully they will be able to. Uh, hopefully, they will be able to 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 cash in this response as we are trying to to work with the Polish government to help them take more ownership of the crisis. Um, um, that uh, this ownership has not been there. I haven't seen it much. I'm afraid, and I think it's really important to for for the UN, for UNHCR, for other leaders to really to to really bring the Polish authorities alongside to the driving seat. Uh, my, I guess my colleagues from the may have a different perspective, but for instance, the Polish uh, ministries do not participate as a co-lead in the in the cluster or shelter or the sector meetings. Um, that there is still a lot of uh, coordination improvements that have to be done. But uh, all in all, the response, the initial phase of the response, have been has has gone very well. I mean, I am proud of my country. I'm proud of my compatriots. Uh, but uh, there are, will be all, obviously uh, challenges in the coming months, not only about the school year, not only about the vulnerable groups, but, you know, winter is coming. And this winter is going to be tough, especially in Eastern Europe, which is very much reliant on the Russian gas, where the, all, the, all the sources of, of, uh, of heating have gone up. They have doubled in, 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 in terms of the prices. So that's going to be a, a difficult time for the vulnerable groups in Poland and for the refugees as well. Many thanks, Wojtek, for that very, um, very comprehensive and, and very clear um, outline of, of how the re response has gone and the need to focus on the most vulnerable for, for humanitarian NGOs and international agencies um, in Poland going forward and, and, and really the need for, uh, for the government to take ownership. Um, and I'm going to turn over to the government representative now, um, to you, Madalena, to hear about uh, the situation and your plans in Romania. Romania is hosting over 80,000 Ukrainian refugees, I understand, and the government's response has been uh, generous. Um, as in Poland, Ukraine refugees have access to employment and services. And I understand that uh, legislation has just been passed today to approve an, a long-term action plan um, for Romania's response to Ukrainian refugees. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that and what your priorities are going to be in the long term, but also how the international humanitarian system can best support those efforts? Over to you. Hello, everybody, and thank you for this kind and generous invitation. I'm very happy to, uh, to meet you uh, this way online. Uh, and also our colleagues from Poland. Poland, um, I'm very grateful to be here and to share some of our experience. Of course, I, uh, I have carefully listened to, to our colleagues from Poland, uh, and there are a lot of uh, 
common points in, uh, in the unfolding of the various sequences of crises. Um, however, I would like to, um, um, to speak a little bit about the Romania's approach to the refugee crisis here in Romania which um, I think it's a little bit different from that of Poland uh, in terms of, um, let's say, of governmental approach. Um, so basically from the first day of the crisis at the end of uh, February, um, we have established here our vision and our, uh, our strategy and how we will going to address the refugee crisis because we understood that it's going to be a, a larger flux of refugees. And uh, the first thing that have, has happened was that at the level of the government of the prime minister's office was set up a task force and the coordinator of the um, humanitarian response. And we decided that we were going to have a two-step approach of the crisis. The first one was, was and still is, in a way, the first emergency response that had to do with all those activities related to the humanitarian aid and civil protection response at the level of the border entry points, because as you probably know, we have the longest border with Ukraine. Um, and basically refers to all the operations and activities conducted at frontline and um, receiving the refugees, and also in relation with the green corridors and all, the entire operational response, which was led uh, by the Department of the, of the Emergency Situation. The second layer of intervention was set up from the beginning as the medium and long-term response, focusing on protection and inclusion of the refugees um, of the refugees from Ukraine who decide to remain in Romania because we have anticipated that not all of them will remain in Romania, as, um, especially due to the, let's say, specific nature of these generally called refugees. Because as you probably know, uh, Romania's borders have been uh, crossed by over 1,200,000 uh, 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 Ukrainian citizens. Uh, out of which more than 90% have entered Romania with biometric and regular passports, which by law made them tourists. I mean, they were able to travel all over Romania and of course, uh, of course, the uh, European Union uh, for a certain period of time. So what, uh, what we, we have done in, the, in that period of time of the emergency response, it was a huge effort at the level of the government to basically uh, change our national legislation. Over 30 pieces of, uh, of laws in Romania have been changed or initiated in order to be able to basically grant um, various types of rights to these persons who by law were just tourists in Romania. Uh, this, was, uh, this was done until the, um, uh, the decision by the uh, Council of European Union with temporary protection, which came, of course, as a relief for everybody of us, because uh, basically gave us the legal framework through which to build on a longer, medium and longer term uh, uh, approach on the, uh, for the refugees who have temporary protection in Romania. And this is how we, um, uh, we reached the phase when we organized ourselves into six working groups uh, at the level of the government uh, in the following areas, education, health, housing, labor, um, children and youth and vulnerable persons. And these working groups basically uh, that were made up uh, from representatives from the key ministries, uh, representatives of the UN agencies present here in Romania, and also local NGOs. They basically designed uh, action plans on how uh, we are going to address the, uh, the inclusion and the protection measures for, uh, for the Ukrainians who have temporary protection in those areas. 
uh, at the end, all these sectorial plans have been coagulated into a, one national uh, plan of measures targeting the inclusion of the um, uh, temporary protected Ukrainians in Romania that, as you told earlier, has, has been approved today by the government through a government ordinance that will enter into effect starting the, the, tomorrow, probably when it will be published in the official journal of Romania. Um, I think this was a crucial step for us. Uh, and I think it was so important because it was a whole society approach. Uh, um, of course, the civil society was so much involved in the emergency response. Uh, the UN agencies did the same but also we needed them on board on medium and long-term measures. And the fact that they have designed uh, specific and proactive uh, measures in this national action plan is very relevant because from our point of view, what we have granted the Ukrainians in the first emergency response, it was good, it was very relevant, but it was not enough because basically, and I'll give you a, a very specific example, for instance, in the first emergency uh, uh, response, uh, when we have changed so many laws that I uh, told you earlier, we have granted the free access to education. But we all know as experts in inclusion or in human rights that just granting the access is not enough. You need to come up with supports, with uh, very specific measures in order to, to make that right effective in practice. So what we have done through this national action plan is that we have put in place basically those specific measures through which the children can, the Ukrainian children can learn, actually learn in our schools, you know, to have um, um, Romanian language courses, support teachers, training the teachers, translators, all these various types of uh, capacity building in order to accommodate them. So um, I think uh, this is very important that we succeeded to have this with, a, with an important uh, budgetary effort for Romania of around 200 million euros for one year. Uh, and I think it is important because we understood that the refugee, Ukrainian refugee crisis is not a sprint. It, will, it is and will be a marathon. So even now it's summer and maybe some people have relaxed and they are thinking about vacation. As my colleague said in Poland, um, uh, the autumn and winter is coming and uh, the, the war situation in Ukraine is volatile and we need to be prepared and we need to have a long term vision uh, of what we are planning to do with these people. And also it is very, very important. I'm happy and I'm as well proud of, uh, of, of the Romania's response, of the civil society response, of the way we succeeded to coordinate. But I think we are in the moment or at the crossroads where we need to start planning together at European level and to coordinate for medium and long-term measures. Because my, my feeling from our pers uh, my perception here in Romania is that uh, at European level, we, we are not yet thinking very well at, um, at this part of integration or inclusion or medium and long-term measures. Everybody is still more fo still focused on the emergency response. And I do believe that some of the uh, measures that we need to take are, uh, is not longer, you know, is not enough to, to have them only at national level. So we need a coordination at European level, especially when it comes to this very, challenging aspects like vulnerable persons, persons with disabilities, we have the same challenges in Romania. Okay, we have a vision and we have a, a plan for medium and long term, but this plan of course is not perfect because the, the system in Romania is not perfect and I guess nowhere else is perfect. And some of the uh, highest vulnerabilities are in the area of vulnerable persons, elderly persons, persons with disabilities, 
And also in terms of social and financial benefits, I think we should coordinate of that in order to avoid pull and push factor. Yes, because if Romania, let's say, grant a benefit of 1,000 euro per month and Poland of 200 euros, then definitely you will have a pull and push factor. So I think what we have uh, ahead of us is a, uh, is a period of uh, consultation and coordination, which we need to, uh, to look at and to use very wisely these two or three months of summer, let's say, relaxation in order to be prepared for the winter and for the autumn. And uh, if we have here present, uh, present uh, partners from, the, uh, from other EU member states, I, I would encourage them to, to, um, to start the dialogue and to start talking about what are we going to do with the 6 million Ukrainians that are now uh, you know, living somewhere in the European Union. Uh, it's very important to, uh, to have a strategic planning and at least uh, a common vision on key areas. So this is from my, from my side. If there are any uh, specific question, I would be very happy to answer about uh, Romania's response to refugee crisis. And thank you again for the invitation and congratulations for, for our colleagues in, uh, in Poland. You are doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madalina, and, and congratulations to you and, uh, and your team and uh, the government's efforts on, in terms of approving this, uh, this national action plan for Ukrainian refugees. And um, just to repeat the very strong call that I've heard from you, for that approach to be, to be taken to the regional level, to the European level, uh, in an integrated fashion. Um, and, recognize your very strong focus on inclusion and protection and to the to the, the the theme of the of the event today the need to maintain this whole of society approach to responding in the long term not to lose um, the, the 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 value that has been brought by civil society organizations in refugee hosting countries um, and i'd like to turn to you to you angela uh, now to give us a sense of how the international response is adapting to to this to this moment of change in in how refugee hosting countries are thinking about the response unhcr launched this um, huge appeal um, in march for for 1.85 billion how much has been raised and um, and what are your priorities and how do they support uh, national governments and civil society organizations over to you thank you patrick and uh, i just wanted to congratulate again uh, madalina for the approval of the action plan to which unhr as you know has contributed immensely i also wanted to actually uh, say that uh, what we have in romania together with what we have in moldova is one of the best examples of how indeed interagency coordination interacts with the coordination of government structures. Uh, Madalena herself, I think she co-leads the Refugee Forum with our representative, uh, Pablo Zapata, but we also part uh, of the government coordination structure. So the, the two structures uh, interact. Uh, we have government uh, membership also in our structure, but we also contribute to there. So I think it's, it's an excellent example of what should happen everywhere. Uh, and indeed, also a good example, probably for for Poland to to follow. But uh, I wanted to indeed um, congratulate uh, the government of Romania for that because we are, they've engaged with us, but not only with us in in uh, in an amazing way. On the refugee response, uh, indeed, you know the regional refugee response plan has been uh, set up and has been developed in a context that it's unprecedented. I mean, not only we're talking about Western Europe. I mean, we have a similar example, but that was during the Syria crisis, it was completely different. Uh, but also the pace in which, you know, people came in, you know, it's not just the numbers themselves, but the, the, really the pace in which all this happened. In less than a week, I think it was already a million people crossing into Europe. Um, the, the first um, uh, version, let's say, of the appeal was on, in March, but we immediately updated it around April. And it brings together some 142 partners. Now, this includes UN agencies, 
civil society organization, local and international, but also private sector. So, um, and this uh, refugee response plan has been um, developed uh, to focus mostly on what we call the, the frontline countries. Those are the five countries that uh, mainly are in the front line, Poland, Moldova, Romania, Slovakia, and Hungary. But also, of course, with um, more focus and additional focus to uh, the countries um, inside Europe, or more, you know, in, uh, in Western Europe, but also in uh, countries like Belarus and the Russian Federation. So, we it's it's a it's a much wider let's say perspective that we have. Um, it, of these partners, I would say that uh, around 114 are uh, civil society organizations, of which 59 are actual national partners. So, in terms of localization of uh, response, uh, this is actually a good example of how we've been able to capture that. Um, I want to really um, uh, underline the role played by grassroots organizations uh, at the beginning of the emergency, at the border, at first reception, because I think if it hadn't been for them, probably we wouldn't have been in a situation we are now. So I think uh, governments need to and I think Madalena, she, she did stress this point. I mean, they need to recognize the importance of engaging with civil society organization. Now, this has not always been the case in the past for other emergencies, but I hope that these good lessons learned will stay and will be applicable also to other type of assistance, not only for Ukrainian refugee. Um, in terms of the um, funding, and the, you said that there was an appeal that, I mean, the refugee appeal was 1.8 billion dollars, but actually 48% is funded at the moment. So it's around 890,000 million. Um, and this, you know, um, this covers uh, four, three, four key priorities. The first one is support to host countries to provide protection and assistance. Now, when we talk about refugee response in this context, but every in every other context, even in Africa and elsewhere, we are there to support government capacities. Because it is the government or, uh, you know, uh, signatory to the Refugee Convention, it is government to provide protection. So we are there to leverage the good practices to support those countries to do so. Then, of course, uh, with that comes identification of solutions, whether the solutions are in host countries or the solutions are elsewhere, or whether it's we're talking about returns or temporary returns or assistance to people who want to, um, uh, to return. And uh, last but not least, I would say effective coordination. Because coordination, I think Kocha says the coordination saves lives. I would probably subscribe to that because, I mean, it seems a bit far-fetched, but if there is efficient and effective coordination, I think um, the, the, the outcome of it and the impact of what we do is quadrupled. So I think it's important then in terms of uh, ensuring regional guidance and assistance at the country level, coordination is key. And I want to also link it to what Madalena said about, you know, the European aspect of it. You know, countries at the country level are doing their best. At the European level, we are part of this, um, I think it's called the Solidarity Platform. They have various working groups. But indeed, um, I would say that we could do better in terms of guidance to, to, um, to governments because we're not any longer, I wouldn't say we're no longer in an emergency situation, but together with the emergency situation, we also have to make sure that inclusion, appropriate inclusion is possible, socioeconomic inclusion, which is the, 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 the government plan in, uh, in the context of Romania, but also that we always look at what can come next. And this means that we have to keep updated the contingency plans because this is not over, winter will come, there may be a bit more outflows because winter is going to be, if it's going to be very hard in Europe, it's going to be much harder in Ukraine. So we have to also uh, factor in that this could be, uh, you know, could trigger some additional additional number of people coming out. So in terms of responsibility sharing, we have seen uh, what can happen when there is a political will. You know, uh, we can do it. We can do it together. And... Um, we, you know, the role and the, the, with the collective efforts and the spirit of the GCR, which is actually the all of society approach, has been exactly what has happened in this context. So I would say that, you know, as a, as a key takeaway and a key lesson learned when it comes to how we have responded, how we have supported the government, I think when there is this cohesion between private sector, uh, government organizations, uh, non-governmental organizations, the UN, uh, the Red Crescent, the Red Cross societies, etc., 
and, and farther afield, we, we can do wonders. And I think um, in this context, we're blessed because we, we have the resources. Um, we have the mechanisms. Those are governments who know exactly what to do. Uh, but indeed, they need help because in the longer term, um, that's where we're going to be tested, let's say. That's where solidarity and responsibility will be tested. So um, I completely, you know, I just wanted to, again, subscribe to what Madalena said and again, congratulate all the governments in the region for what they've done. Uh, and thank you again. Over. Many thanks, Angela, um, for, for underlining the, the role of UNHCR and the international humanitarian system in supporting um, host countries' capacities, both government and civil society, and the importance of this cohesion and integrated whole of society approach to, to refugee response in the region. Um, before I come on to, you know, is, is the current um, international support Feed for purpose in, in, in that context. Um, I'm going to move to the, the first question that, that we have uh, from our audience, uh, a question from MSF, um, particularly about precisely this, this civil society effort at the beginning of uh, the crisis, particularly at the border in terms of receiving and, and providing emergency support to people who were who were crossing and wondering, you know, how those networks are, are feeling at the moment. Um, are, they, are they just basically tired by now? Um, do, they, do they still have support? Do they still have uh, donations, funding that enable them to, to continue or not? And I was wondering, Wojtek, if you, if you were able to give us a sense of what the situation is for, for, for these volunteers in, in Poland in particular. Well, thanks. It's a, it's a very good, it's a very good uh, uh, question because in all of such responses, when there is a massive volunteering outburst, and this was the case in, in Poland, I assume also in, in Romania and other countries, you know, it, there is a finite, finite uh, duration of it, and the volunteers have to go back to their to their day to day jobs. I mean, there are there is a, a factor of fatigue building in. Um, the, also, the the influx has been up to one hundred forty thousand persons per day, versus you know a few thousand today. Um, I was um, I'm PCPM is working with UNHCR in the eastern Poland city of Lublin, and I'm um, arriving on the highway quite often. On the way back, there is a there is a gas station. Next to this gas station that is still running now, four months into the war, an ad hoc um, um, rest area for the buses with Ukrainian refugees who are going to Poland. And I was talking to one of the, the guys managing a, a kielbasa, so a, a sausage stand at that at that point. And I asked him, well, I was trying to break an ice. I was saying, oh, you have we have still a lot of people here today, don't we? And he says, well, this is not, not a lot of people. I had this I has distributed. 600 kilograms of, of sausages in two days. And then I got two tons of French fries and it was also gone in two days because this is the level of influx that was there by in, in February or March. Right now, there is indeed a lot of fatigue building in. Um, what is the, the priority for the NGOs is very much to shift the, those volunteers who can support, they can work on the response into some sort of a work contracts to give them the stability to give to, to use their skills because they have built incredible skills to continue the employment also there is a very strong at least in case of poland there is a very strong of the uh, role of the local authorities and major cities in poland even uh, the the county level uh, cities they have they have they are still running the assistance centers for european refugees still trying to to to, to be a platform where those people willing to uh, to provide assistance, such as apartments uh, or, or shelters, can 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 uh, there, there, is, there is a platform where people in need can can come and and, and get. But indeed, very much this whole uh, response is shifting into something which more resembles the the traditional humanitarian uh, humanitarian response. But uh, at least in case of Poland, many of the families are really now you know managing by. I mean, in contrast to Romania. Polish language and Ukraine are very close. Uh, I've been talking to, my, my son has several uh, Ukrainian kids in his schools. Now they are managing to speak in Polish. Now, now they are following the Polish curriculum. 
So this starts to look, um, you know, at least for for majority of the refugees, it is it is it looks reasonably good. But again, um, the focus should be on the most vulnerable groups. Thanks, Wojtek. Um, we have a, a few questions in in the chat that that relate to to really the, the role of international humanitarian assistance in the context of, as we've heard, countries that have significant capacity, both from the government and civil society, and have demonstrated that, that capacity to respond quickly. Um, and, and the question as to whether international humanitarian assistance in the way that it, it is delivered and has been delivered in, in Ukraine and, and the region is really, fit to support these capacities um, because basically we we've heard several reports prior to, to this event that in spite of these capacities existing the international agencies have still tended to set up their own operations as well and didn't really find a very easy way to to provide resources to to the government or all civil societies organizations directly. Um, and I was wondering, Madalena, going forward, now that you have established this whole of society plan, you, you mentioned support from UN agencies in particular. Um, how do you see the, the role of international agencies, and in particular, international humanitarian agencies, whether they are UN, Red Cross, or NGOs, changing? Are you getting what you need now? As a government from that system, or, or you know, should they do something different, or should they step aside? And, and maybe what you maybe what you need at this stage is longer term uh, financing support. Over to you. Well, uh, thank you. This is a very important question, and uh, I'm happy that you are asking it. Um, well, uh, I would like to say that uh, the role of the international humanitarian organizations or agencies was and still is crucial uh, in this response. And I would like to argue and to explain why. Uh, of course, we it is true and we have to admit that uh, it was a process and it's normal that it was like this. Of course, uh, these international organizations came in Romania and probably in other countries with their own set of, let's say, way of doing things, which is very normal, it is their mandate and so on and so forth. But the key is, the, is communication and coordination. And also we, uh, we, have, uh, we don't have to forget the fact that this refugee crisis is so much different from any other refugee crisis from Iraq, Syria, uh, Afghanistan and so on and so forth. So it's normal that the uh, that in the early days of uh, of let's say the of the intervention of the international organization to be let's say a sort of um, looking for the right answer to adapt to the context. But this is why here in Romania we st uh, we stood at the same table. We discussed the, uh, the, uh, the, our approach, the governmental approach, uh, the UN agencies approach, and this is how we uh, uh, we find the solution to work together in a European context, a European Union context, because we have to remember that also Romania is a EU member state, and we had our own, let's say, uh, obligations and rules to follow, rules to follow at the level of the European Union. But um, eventually, we, I, I think we found the best solution, at least in our case, because we uh, built together a system of coordination in which we complement each other. So basically, uh, our response, the government response, is complemented by the UN or UNHCR RRP, Regional Response Plan. So uh, in those areas where, let's say, Romanian government have some limits, or we do not have enough resources, or we have the, do not have the enough expertise to do some things, there is the place where UNHCR and the other agencies, together with the local NGOs, are coming and, and filling the gaps. 
Um, so I, I won't judge here in terms of um, it was not um, uh, the best intervention. They came with uh, their own plan uh, because it is a process. We are learning by doing because it's a totally new type of crisis. Of course, it's a refugee crisis, but with a very different landscape. The Ukrainian refugees are not the refugees we are used to know. The context is not Africa, it's European Union. Um, uh, we have, you know, uh, rule of law in our countries, we have structures, institutions, but at the same time, we have vulnerabilities and limits. So it, I think it took a lot of um, flexibilities from the UN agencies, from the part of UN agencies and other international organizations to be able to navigate such a new and complex context and to come to, and to reach uh, a common understanding of the thing. I think right now we are uh, working in a, in a very good coordination with the UN agencies and other international organizations. Um, we can improve uh, uh, some things, at least in the case of uh, Red Cross, in terms of the, their way of doing cash assistance. But that's why that's why we have the interagency co uh, coordination mechanism. We have the governmental coordination groups, and we um, we did our best to keep you know uh, an open uh, an open conversation all the time with uh, less formalities and more oriented towards uh, facts, and, facts and results. Thank you. Uh, I might come back to you on the, on the Red Cross and cash transfers, but I, I, I think Wojtek uh, had his hand raised. Did you want to add something on this question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think one thing has to be said um, um, and, and I really highlighted in, um, well, my understanding is when there are uh, uh, refugees coming to Western Europe, when they are provided social assistance, that one is, you know, is sufficient for them to, to, to live on that social assistance, at least in the, in the initial stages of their, of their time in the, in the host country. Uh, the, the social assistance levels in Poland, and I may also guess also in Romania and other countries in Eastern Europe, are extremely low. And there is no way uh, those social assistance levels will be in any way sufficient for the European Union refugees to cover their, their, their basic needs, especially as, for instance, in Poland, the rates of social assistance do not include any housing allowance, and the shortage of housing, to some extent stemming from the Second World War, is, is the number one challenge. So, for instance, the level, the minimal expenditure level in Poland, which is also at the level of the cash assistance and something similar to the, to the uh, social assistance levels in Poland is about 700 slotties, so about $160 per person per month, while in the, late, the major cities you would have to pay triple that to rent an apartment. So uh, labeling that assistance that exceeds the levels of social assistance as humanitarian aid, it is useful for us because it allows us to stimmy um, um, any Clash back from the from from people in need of social assistance on the Polish side, while the why the assistance for the refugees is significantly higher, and also it is very useful I think on the political front because then the local the the, the national authorities can say well see this international assistance even if it's higher it's paid by international donors, but um, so unfortunately what we are not seeing now is that we are not seeing at least in Poland the major funding level from uh, funding involvement from the Polish government towards the NGOs, even though the Polish government is zooming on highlighting three areas of, of need for the humanitarian aid, international players and NGOs to, to assist. One is housing, especially in, in view of the upcoming winter and the phase of the, of the uh, host uh, family um, arrangements. The second one is the care for the women and children, uh, especially for children during the summer and after the after their school holidays. And thirdly, is the is the care for the most vulnerable groups because already the government is is is, is starting to realize this is going to be a major challenge. Thank you, Wojtek. Um, I'm going to maybe ask Angela to to comment on 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 this issue of of how to how to best support um, from the humanitarian system in, in the medium to, to long term, how 
is your strategy evolving to, to do just that? And there's also a question that has come uh, from ICRC in, um, in London, which relates to social cohesion. I mean, given the, the challenges that we've just heard from Wojtek in terms of um, competition for housing, for services, et cetera, is, is there a risk that, um, that social cohesion starts to, to be fragmented in, in refugee hosting countries? What about refugees from, from other countries uh, hosted in Europe at the moment? And, and, and how does that interplay with the, the situation? What is um, UNHCR thinking, if, if anything, on, on these issues at the moment? Thank you, Patrick. Indeed, as, as um, other speakers were, were talking, I was, I was trying to, um, to look at some of the things that were said. I mean, I, I wanted to say in terms of the long-term um, planning, I mean, we have some lessons learned when it came to uh, what UNHCR and others have been doing in Greece. I mean, remember that, I mean, the, the Syria operation basically mentioned, I mean, it, it was the first time the UNHCR was operationally involved in a EU country to that extent. Um, some of the lessons learned are indeed that there needs to be a, a more harmonized approach at the, at the, at the level of Brussels. Um, in terms, I think uh, Madalena was talking about the different um, social safety net and the different fees and the different type of uh, uh, you know social benefits that people get because European countries are different they have different systems so that has to be taken on board because already we have seen people that were moving from one country to another because indeed you know they were talking to each other on whatever online etc saying you know you get more money if you go to this country instead of staying where you are so there has to be a harmonized approach because um, we are afraid that then that solidarity and that natural relocation that it's what UNICEF have been you know uh, advocating for since the central Mediterranean emergency you know have a supporting mechanism where people relocate across Europe that was never uh, uh, something that could have been, you know, enacted, and we have proved that this can happen. Now, in the long term, how do you sustain those governments who have actually been able to to contribute to that? Indeed, uh, there needs to be an harmonized approach at the level of Brussels, and that's why um, when I talked about the strategy of UNHCR, it's not only in terms of uh, cash-based intervention that we have in those countries. I think I mentioned uh, we at the moment, you know, our cash-based intervention to indeed, you know, make that transitional step towards the government social safety net um, a bit softer, let's say the landing should be softer. So UNHCR has been providing cash in Europe. So I mean, that is already something that, you know, it's, it's unprecedented uh, for around three, I think the target is 350,000 people, which is one, some of the most vulnerable that we have identified. And indeed, um, the cash is around 170 uh, euro per person. Um, and then Moldova, we're doing the same thing in Romania and the same thing in Slovakia. Uh, this has helped immensely the government, but indeed, um, I think in the longer term, because, you know, we're not a development agency, there needs to be other mechanism that kicks in. And that's why I talked about the, let's say, the, the funding and the structures at the level of the region of Brussels that uh, complement what they call the AMI funds. The AMI funds are national funds that EU countries have uh, that they can use for migration, asylum and reception condition. Now, these funds, of course, have been used probably by the governments, uh, um, you know, to assist uh, the Ukrainians um, and have been depleted probably. And this, you know, the amount of money that now uh, these countries are receiving should be able, let's say, to cover and complement and kick in once, you know, the humanitarian first transitional period would, would stop. Now, during the winter, we have, we're in discussion with governments because indeed, what is also happening, I think it's the Polish government, but probably other governments too, are providing cash to host families. So the host families are getting contribution. And uh, I think the Polish government had a plan to stop at a certain point, but indeed discussing with us, they realized that probably during the winter, that's where you need to keep that kind of, uh, let's say, I mean, it's not much, but it's already something so that that social cohesion is not eroded because indeed, um, I think this winter is not gonna be harsh just for the refugees, but it's gonna be harsh for everybody, all of us. Um, so those are the strategy. Then there is, a, and not, so the country level, uh, but at the country level, we're also working with municipalities. So what we're trying to do is um, the local NGOs, we're trying to 
uh, to get the local municipality to actually uh, bring them on board and be their tools to support the, the society. Um, in the past, and I can give you an example uh, what the past was uh, for Poland, um, I think it was, no, I think it was Slovakia, but anyway, some civil society organization have never been able to engage with the government because, you know, whatever reasons. So they they saw us as a bridge to, to make that link so that they can work uh, together with the government, not only for the refugees, but actually to support the host communities and civil society organizations that are actually, you know, uh, at the beginning have actually been, uh, let's say, um, uh, very, very generous without any funding whatsoever. Another element that we have is actually uh, what we're, we're putting in practice in Moldova, but I think it could, it could be applicable elsewhere, is uh, what Madalena talked about, the humanitarian corridors, but also the airlifts from Moldova. Romania, let's not forget, they, they're not only catering for their own refugees, but they're letting um, a, a safety valve out of Moldova for people who want to leave. So they, they have provided this humanitarian corridor so that people can actually leave and go either to Romania or onward to other countries. Um, so we, we are beefing that up. We're thinking of using that system elsewhere, but also the airlifts in Moldova for the most vulnerable, for medical cases that go directly from Moldova to other EU countries where that medical service, that medical provision is, is possible. So th there are systems in place that can be used in support of governments, but indeed, you know, in the longer term, I think those structures that they have in place in the European Union should kick in to be able to support uh, throughout the winter because housing indeed is a major issue. Uh, access to education will be one also, but also, as I said, some people who may have returned to Ukraine may decide to go back out uh, at the end of the summer. So we need to be uh, ready also for that. Over. Thank you very much, Angela. And and you, at the end there, um, started to answer another question that that's come in that that is about Ukrainians who are. Um, actually returning to parts of Ukraine that uh, they think that they can return to at the moment and, and whether that, that's changing the planning. But we're very quickly running out of time, so I'm going to maybe ask each one of you to um, maybe for a very few quick thoughts um, to, to, to end this, this conversation and um, maybe a final reflection on on what is needed um, going forward, particularly from the humanitarian system. Over to you, Wojtek. Well, um, thanks. Uh, I, um, after the 9th of May, after the, 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 the 9th of May parade in, in, in um, Moscow, we saw a quite significant return of refugees from Poland towards Ukraine, which very, very quickly peppered out. Uh, and uh, we indeed expect some sort of, of uh, maybe not an influx, but an increased movement back to Poland before the beginning of September, because there are those additional factors at play that we'll be never able to predict, such as that the, the, the school in Ukraine have been on e-learning from the very first days of pandemics. They never had the proper school. So many families may be tempted to move to, to Poland, to other countries, because of schools, because of imploding economy, because of constant uh, threat and harassment, there are multiple factors at play. So I think all of the response actors, we really need a second um, injection of, of capacity and assistance. I mean, I saw the comments that um, uh, some of the funding is still unused. Well, in our case, it's not the case. I mean, we the, 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 the funding is, is going very fast and we already know that that come the second time half of the year the funding is going to be a challenge and i sincerely hope somebody has an idea for this because we see this is a, is a major challenge coming up thank you very much for having me on the panel thank you very much Wojtek. um over to you madalina well uh thank you very much there are so many things to uh, to talk about this crisis but um I would like to highlight from my point of view, at least uh, a couple of them. So first of all, um, I'd like to, um, to underline the idea that it's important to look at the refugee, at the Ukrainian refugees, not merely as 
uh, like at objects of our protection. So from my perspective, it's very important to help them become independent uh, in our countries and to put in place all these, all the necessary measures to be able to support them in order to become, you know, uh, self-reliant and uh, autonomous in our countries. Uh, and from that moment on, that means that uh, we are successful. And all the measures, the protection measures we have put in place have actually this aim. Um, the second thing that I'd like to underline is that we need to remain focused on coordination and we need to talk together at European level to identify common, uh, a common vision on medium and long term and of course to have an ongoing support and coordination with donors. It is very important to, to have this issue in place because as you have seen, the governments are doing as much they can, at least in Romania, uh, but it is important to, to have also a common, uh, a common and shared approach with the donors who are so much contributing through the international humanitarian organizations, local NGOs, uh, and other partners who are basically supporting and building actually the response by the countries. I'm not seeing as the government response and the civil society response, it's a whole response um, uh, constructed by so many other partners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madalina. Um, unfortunately, we've, we've now run out of time, so I'm going to have to, to wrap up, but thank you so much to all our speakers and, and to you, our audience, for participating and, and contributing to this very rich discussion. I mean, it's very clear that as the conflict in Ukraine becomes protracted, um, now is the time to pause and reflect on the best medium to long-term approach to support refugees in, in neighboring countries and the rest of Europe. We've heard very strong calls for uh, continued support to civil society group and the whole of society response, but also maybe a much better European level coordination in terms of defining uh, a common approach, but also um, raising uh, the financing streams necessary to, to support the approach. Um, it's an ongoing conversation, which I invite you to continue, uh, for example, on social media using the, the HPG ODI handle um, and to share the recording of this discussion. Uh, it will be available in a couple of days and we will send uh, the recording to everyone who has signed up to the event. You will also find a link in the chat to subscribe to the HPG newsletter, as well as a link to our feedback form. Thanks again and goodbye.